So next, uh, I want to introduce uh, our next presenter, um, and uh, I'm very uh, uh, pleased to have with us today the person who I think is uh, the most knowledgeable of uh, uh, the Koch brothers and their uh, devious deeds of anybody that I, I believe in the country. And I'm so privileged that we have Lisa Graves with us today to share that uh, information. Thank you, Lisa. myself, but if you want to come on in, come come on in, come on in. Man, I just, I, I used to be able to stand for hours and hours, but uh, but this is a long day, we've got to look out for ourselves, so. So, uh, before, before I get started on what I had planned to say, I just want to um, thank Nate, Tim, and um, you know, Nate, I think of Nate as such a visionary uh, in this community, in our state, uh, and really nationally in terms of really trying to help uh, help build a grassroots movement that, that is vibrant, that uh, is active in our communities, not just uh, in our cities, um, and that is addressing some of the fundamental weaknesses of two-party politics in this country where you uh, have parties that, for instance, aren't investing in science. Uh, there's a consultant class, there's a lot of money going into polling or to you know focus groups or whatever um, and uh, I don't know about you but when I when I travel in this state uh, during the Walker uh, elections I saw Walker sign after Walker sign after Walker sign stand with Walker and I barely saw any democratic signs or progressive signs uh, and I started seeing these amazing handmade signs that they and a team of people uh, through the Wisconsin uh, Grassroots Network and others have really brought forth and those signs aren't just about uh, a particular candidate, they're about elections, they're about our democracy, they're about sharing information, and a lot of communities that have been devastated uh, by a, you know lack of local news, uh, you know not hearing what's happening, not getting information, and so I just want to say um, I am just a huge fan, Nate, and I just uh, if we could just thank Nate. Really. <laughs> So I don't know who my timekeeper is, and I, I need to know because my husband said that if I got paid by the word, I might be a millionaire. <laughs> uh, so is, is someone? Do you know who the timekeeper is? Can someone? Can someone give me when when I when I have 15 minutes left and 10 minutes left and five minutes? Who? Man raising his hand. Okay. All right. And then one minute. <laughs> and you can even be 30 seconds. It would be amazing what I could say in 30 seconds. You have to tell us how many minutes you have all together. Okay. All right. Someone please give me the sign. So um, anyway, uh, uh, and it's also a tremendous honor to follow, to follow Matt. He's uh, spent so much time and effort really uh, trying to advance these issues and causes and the work that he's doing at the at Wisconsin Democracy Campaign is so vitally important even with the efforts of the uh, the legislature and the governor to, to limit the information we have WDC is so important and it's an honor to be on this panel uh, I'm just not going to go into this whole but love you all so um, anyway uh, I've been asked to talk about uh, the rise of corporate power and the Koch brothers, and um, I know Jane Mayer has a fantastic new book out that I hope you've read or you're reading, uh, Dark Money. We contributed research to that uh, book. It's fantastic. Uh, this is not um, this is not a synopsis of Jane's book, um, but I'm hoping to get into some of these some of these issues uh, for you and with you. Um, my name is Lisa Graves, and I'm the executive director of the Center for Media and Democracy. Uh, you may have heard of it. 
published PR Watch and Source Watch. Uh, we launched the Alex Exposed investigation. In fact, it was almost five years ago, actually five years ago this month, that a whistleblower came to me with a set of bills that had been secretly voted on by corporations. Uh, the whistleblower had taken those documents to another organization that was afraid of publishing them because it was in the middle of the WikiLeaks crackdown. Uh, where there was an effort to um, really chill uh, the release of documents from whistleblowers. Um, and uh, I said, hell yeah, I'll publish those documents. As far as I'm concerned, every one of those documents is already published. They're in every legislature in the country. The only thing that people know, don't know is that they're ALEC bills. Uh, that asbestos disaster, the, the effort to cut back the rights of people who uh, are suffering from asbestosis, from cancer, are dying uh, because their lungs have been contaminated by, by asbestos. That's an ALEC bill. Uh, stricter voter ID, making it harder for Americans to vote. That, those were ALEC bills. Um, <clears throat> the plastic bag bill that uh, just was signed into law to preempt plastic bag uh, bans. Oh, that's an ALEC bill. Uh, so when we, um, when I got the bills, I was, uh, really surprised, because I consider myself a pretty well-informed person. I've been in Washington for um, 15 years before coming to Wisconsin to take on uh, the Center for Media Democracy, and I had no idea that this was going on. And what happened when I looked at those bills was, was not just that there was this depth and breadth of bills from 40 years of efforts to change our law. Basically, every bad domestic idea, almost, that I had heard of in my lifetime, that was an ALEC bill <laughs> as I looked at them. And then they had a little packet, which was their 101 packet for corporations, for the corporations that fund them. And it said this thing that I didn't realize when the whistleblower gave me the documents. It said, um, through ALEC, the public sector and private sector have an equal voice and vote. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, wait, <laughs> hold on a second. The corporations are voting? Um, and then I, we looked into it some more. We worked with uh, a, another organization and we were trying to find out more. And it turned out, in fact, they were voting. That that was true. The pitch for the corporations was that through ALEC, you get one-stop shopping. Corporations, global corporations from around the world uh, and the country come to a fancy resort. Uh, thousands of state legislators, le legislators in the country come to this, these events three times a year. One is their big annual event. And corporations pay for a, a seat and a vote on ALEC task forces where they literally vote as equals with our legislators without the press or public present on these bills before they're introduced in our state legislators, legislatures. And I was shocked. It's shocking, it's perverse, it's outrageous, it's appalling. And I was shocked both at the corporations doing this, although I, I sort of understand, hey, if they can get a vote without being elected, <laughs> on these bills and they can pay 10 grand, which for them is a pittance, uh, to get this vote, why wouldn't they? What I was really appalled by was that these politicians were so subservient that they would dare to believe it was okay to give corporations an equal vote to themselves, unelected corporate lobbyists from the biggest special interests in the country, an equal vote to themselves, um, <clears throat> and then come back to our legislatures and introduce these bills as if they were their own ideas. <laughs> Cleanse of any reference to Alec. So it was shocking, so we launched Alec Exposed five years ago this summer, and um, it has been a tremendous experience really uncloaking uh, corporate power in this country. Um, so where I was gonna begin on the sort of the personal is political, the political is personal uh, front, okay, um, is uh, the last time I was here was three years ago, and I was actually really sick that day, I don't know how many of you were here, but I, I was really sick and I had had this a terrible, terrible cough uh, and it turned out I was, I was dying of cancer. And um, I didn't know, because I was in the middle of the fight against Alec. And we had, un we had connected the dots on the Stand Your Ground bill and Trayvon Martin, and it was busy, busy, busy trying to push these corporations out of Alec, and I was tired um, because, you know, I thought I was just working too hard. Um, but it turned out that I was ex extremely ill, and the doctors at the university saved my life, the University of Wisconsin. Um, <laughs> I'm very glad to be alive, uh, and I'm very glad to be back, and I'm very glad to be back at the, grass, the Wisconsin Grassroots uh, Network Festival. Um, but you know what, when, when I, when I, you know, I've heard of cancer, right? I've had pe known people who had cancer, but you know, you, you walk into that hospital and you realize that it is an absolute, ap an absolute epidemic. It is an epidemic. Uh, every race, every background, every age, and um, 
And, and, you know, and then you hear these pledges, the Koch brothers donated some money to cancer research, you know. But this is, a, this is I, I think in some ways this is an issue where, um, why, is it, why is it the private sector's role to cure cancer, to profit from curing cancer? Isn't this fundamentally a public issue? We should be seriously investing more in addressing cancer, and, and not just the symptom of cancer, but the causes of cancer. The, the chemicals, the uh, other things in our environment that are really leading to higher rates of um, cancer. And um, I mention that in part because uh, in the course of my research into these dark money groups, one of the dark money groups that popped in the last presidential election was the CEO of Cancer Centers of America. Uh, he was creating these pop-up groups out of a post office box to run cash through into you know, these elections and not tell you that he was doing it. And I thought, man, that is an incredible thing. What's happened in many ways in this anti-regulatory environment that has been pushed forward since Reagan and before is that we have created this, these concentrations of wealth among these CEOs that have, um, I think, deeply distorted views of both our world and the role of government and the role in our democracy. And that guy uh, is you know, just one of the guys that pals around with all these other billionaires trying to basically, in my view, wreck our country. Uh, to push into law their very narrow perspective of what government should do, limited government, uh, which is a mask for basically just defense, pre predominantly in police, uh, and not the things that make our country strong, make our country great, um, that really have made our, 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 our lives better and thrive. And those, the things that have made our lives better, have made our country stronger, are things that we do as a public, that we do together. That we, you know, it's not just, you know, it's not just saying we're going to put a man on the moon. You know, now it's the private sector, I guess, that gets to explore space. Um, it's that we decide as a, as a people, as a society, as a democracy, that we believe in public education. So we're going to fund it, you know. Uh, we believe in uh, having health care for health care for all. That people don't just die because they're poor. You know, oh, you didn't get, you know, you didn't, you didn't make the right choice. You got laid off from Enron. Sorry, you, you know, you don't have health care. You, you know, too bad. Um, but I have to tell you that we are in a contest, and you know this. We are in a contest between the forces of greed and the forces of good, in my opinion. And the forces of greed have a lot of money at their disposal. Um, so how did we get here? Um, in some ways, as John Nichols will say uh, eloquent, super eloquently, I'm sure, uh, later today, this is a contest between capital uh, and the concentration of wealth and democracy that's been going on for a long time in this country. It didn't start last week, last month, last year. Um, it was you know, the big battle of the, of the robber baron era, of the, of the railroads, and we pushed them back. And then uh, it was a big battle over the um, tremendous changes in, in the, you know, ridiculous work policies we had in this country 100 years ago. Child labor, you know, eight, eight day work weeks, sorry, seven day work weeks. What does that mean? It's just like working all the time. It's not a seven day work week. It's, you know, no vacation, no weekends, no nothing. Um, and so we've won over tremendous obstacles over time, but this battle keeps coming back and coming back. And in this instance, this battle, uh, I think, this modern battle uh, really can be traced very clearly to the tobacco industry, which you know, big uh, cause of cancer still in this country, um, and also, um, you know, the Koch brothers. Uh, and I don't say that lightly. Um, I've studied them in depth, and I can tell you that we have materials that are coming out this spring that document their role going back to the 60s. They do these nice op-eds in the Wall Street Journal claiming they just now, just recently got involved in politics. I don't know why people are so upset. <laughs> you know, we have documents that show what they have been up to since the 60s. And uh, as I wrote about a couple of years ago uh, for the Progressive Magazine, um, you know, uh, Charles Koch was a bircher. He was a member of the John Bircher. It wasn't just his dad. It didn't just like, oh, the dad was crazy. No, no, uh, no. Uh, that apple didn't fall far from that tree, you know? So, um, so you know, when I've been going through archives across the country, some of the things we've seen is uh, in the 50s, in the, in the dark heart of McCarthyism, you know, coming out of this uh, terrible senator from our state, uh, it was the manufacturers, the National Association of Manufacturers, who were pushing to crush labor, right to work policies then. 
Uh, they were, some of those guys were instrumentally involved in the John Birch Society. It wasn't just a conspiracy, it was leading business figures from our, from Wisconsin, from states across the country. Same thing, the Diane Hendricks of their day, basically. And they were, they, they tried to mask this as communism, that the idea that people would have public schools was somehow communistic, that we would have a Supreme Court that would actually honor the words of our Constitution of equal, um, that everyone is entitled to equal protection of the law, not segregated schools, that was somehow a communist conspiracy. You know, all these things they try to dress up as um, communism or communist conspiracies, which was ridiculous. And ultimately they were discredited uh, for um, basically saying that even Eisenhower was somehow a communist, which is for sure one of the most ridiculous things I've ever heard, although this campaign season has tested. <laughs> uh, yeah. Tested the bounds of ridiculous. But, um, but uh, so, you know, Charles Koch has been at this literally since like 1962. 1962. Uh, he has been mapping out this vision, and it is a vision fundamentally built on uh, the morality of greed. And for a huge part of his effort, um, when people before the internet, uh, when the newspapers were only sort of partly paying attention to some of these things, he was called uh, by fellows in that movement an, an anarcho-capitalist. He was promoting anarcho-capitalism. Uh, he was described as someone who was promoting this very extreme form of capitalism in which government needed to get out of regulating corporations in every possible way and let businesses do what they wanted. <clears throat> this was in the 60s. So when you look at that history, what you see is a really crucial moment in 1971 when the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, um, and some of you know this history, but when the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, uh, in the middle of the Nixon administration, because the Congress had dared to start to look at clean air and clean water, and you know, cars that were completely unsafe. Uh, how dare they? How, how dare Congress try to look into public safety and public health <clears throat> the, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce commissioned this examination of why, why was this happening. And this memo uh, was written by Lewis Powell, who later became a justice on the U.S. Supreme Court, who Nixon put on the Supreme Court. Um, and Lewis Powell actually said in this memo, I'm going to paraphrase, this you have to remember this, and you, some of you may remember this, he said, nobody in the entire United States has as little power in government and in America as the American business and the American businessman. <laughs> wow. They believe, even with their enormous wealth and the influence they, they had had up to that point, <clears throat> that they were the least powerful and that they were deserving of more power. And he mapped out a plan in every walk of life uh, to have the state chambers of commerce you know, be more actively involved in these political issues, not just you know, business regulation, but you know, purely regulatory matters <clears throat> in the purest sense, you know, liquor licenses, whatever, um, to really have them involved. They mapped out a plan to engage students to raise generations of right-wingers, basically, corporatists. They mapped out a plan uh, to, uh, to, to basically create these instruments like ALEC, you know, that we needed to have, <laughs> we needed to take over the state legislatures. <clears throat> they mapped out, you know, all these vehicles. And um, when I looked at it, I thought, who is Lewis Powell? What do I actually know about Lewis Powell? Oh, it turns out Lewis Powell was, Lewis Powell was the tobacco lawyer. Oh. He was the guy in the 1960s who was fighting tooth and nail, dirty, uh, deceptive, bullshit tactics to keep the Surgeon General from regulating tobacco, which was killing people. That's, that's, who, that's who Lewis Powell is. That's what that legacy is. And the funny thing, and it's not so funny, <clears throat> the funny thing about that memo, the, the Powell memo, is that Charles Koch read that memo and said it didn't go far enough. <laughs> didn't go far enough. Uh, that's who Charles Koch has been for years, before he was a multi, multi, multi-billionaire. Um, and uh, he began creating organizations in the 1970s when no one was paying attention. Numerous organizations, organizations devoted to uh, privatizing our public schools, organizations devoted to, um, uh, and I'll tell you this because we're going to write about it shortly, but um, Charles Koch in the 70s looked around and said, uh, I've been studying education and um, you know what's wrong with, public, with universities in this country? They cost too little. We have those documents. We'll be sharing those soon. 
So you imagine a situation when, when college actually was affordable, when public, when the states were actually supporting our universities. Charles Cook said it was a problem because it wasn't market-based pricing. Uh, it was it was inappropriate for the state to be providing helping people go to college. It should be cost a lot more. That's who Charles Cook is. <clears throat> 1977, pushing efforts back then to kill Social Security to privatize it. 77, 78. By 1979, he had pushed so much money into this movement that the people who were in that movement called him the Coctopus. It wasn't us, you know, five years ago, seven years ago. It was his allies who said he had too much power then. So since then, you know, his brother ran for uh, vice president uh, to self-fund that campaign to the right of Ronald Reagan, got 1% of the vote. After losing that, they've spent the last 40 years, 30 years, investing in this um, thing that is, is these planting these seeds that we are now seeing the fruit of. Uh, so many of the things we care about under attack. Um, every, basically, you know, every major bad bill uh, <clears throat> domestically that's been pushed to the states has been an ALEC bill, whether it's tort reform, changes to education, charter schools, you know, I could, I have a whole site that's about this, ALEC exposed, you know, the list goes on and on. Who is ALEC's biggest funder? Oh, you know, it's Coke's. Of course it is, right? Of course it is. It's Coke Industries, so they get a tax write-off as a charity for giving to ALEC. Uh, it's the Koch brothers through their charitable instruments giving to ALEC. It's the Koch brothers giving to their multiplicity of uh, their you know, hydra of organizations that then give money to ALEC. <clears throat> and as a result, the Kochs have not just one vote in these ALEC task forces where your legislators, our legislators, some of these legislators are voting with corporations. They have multiple votes. They have funded these things that we call stink tanks. <laughs> <laughs> These think tanks, the State Policy Network think tanks. Uh, we just wrote a story last week uh, about how in Flint, obviously there are lots of things that went wrong in terms of Snyder's policies um, and this devastating poisoning of children and adults. But what we wrote about was, in fact, this was an idea of uh, the Mackinac Center, um, the stink tank in Michigan, uh, who's funded by another billionaire buddy of the Kochs, the DeVos family, the Amway fortune. And uh, they were saying, you know, you need to have massive expanded emergency manager powers. They pushed and pushed and pushed it. And the first emergency manager appointed by Snyder was a Mackinac Center guy. Um, and so you have a situation in which um, that was for the city of Pontiac, not Flint. Um, but you have a, and oh, and by the way, uh, he, he, forward, he, he continued a contract um, to uh, contract with a corporate water service that was under indictment. This was before Flint. So, you know, these guys are corrupt, in my opinion. They, they, are, they're, they're, they talk a lot about the Republicans, the GOP, the, um, the conservatives, talk a lot about values and family values and moral values. I'm just going to go like two minutes, if that's all right. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, th maybe three, but okay, then I will stop my comments. Uh, you know, they talk about these values, but then when you see how they act, what bills they push, what legislation they push, destroying our right to vote, really, uh, making it hard for America's vote, making it harder for us to have a voice in our government, taking down disclosure, uh, trying to kill rules that prevent this coordination with these CEOs and these uh, corporations through these dark money groups uh, in our elections. Uh, when you look at the substantive agenda, it is, um, I, think, I think it's an immoral agenda, quite frankly. It's an agenda that's fundamentally at odds with core American values. And on the left, I think, obviously we've had this longer fight about the moral majority and values voters and who, who are values. And I think there's obviously some sensitivity to saying, you know, this is a moral fight or um, they're immoral or that's an immoral policy. We, we the, certainly the Democrats talk about policies that's very sort of intellectual in some way. But, you know, I think that's why, and I, I know Lakoff came a year or two ago and talked about this. I think that's why the Democrats, in many ways, lose because if it's just a policy, then you know you're going to negotiate and they're going to like get a slice or a heel of the bread or a crumb or something. Because it's, it's a policy, and you know. But if it's your values, you're going to fight for it until you get it. And what's happened on the right is that they have conceived of these things as values. Uh, they have a belief about. Um, the Second Amendment, a belief about this first notion that you have a free speech right to spend unlimited money. They think of these as values, right to life issues. They think of these as fights that they're going to fight until they win them. I think that in some ways those are deeply distorted, but what I would say to you is 
from my perspective in DC and in Madison, one of the fundamental problems is that we're not talking about, not all of us, not many of us, are talking about these things as really moral issues. So when Bernie says healthcare is a right, people are like, you know, we, I mean, a lot of people sort of say, yeah, but you know, that's not the discourse. You know, that, that's sort of, it's not in the Constitution, so is it a right? Well, we don't, we, don't, we don't let the Constitution define necessarily what our rights are. We need to say what we want and what we need. And so um, what I wanted to say really in conclusion, um, and I wanted one more teaser, which is we do have a story coming on Monday or Tuesday about um, these local chambers of commerce that you will find very interesting. So come to our site, PR Watch, and check it out. Um, because we are constantly exposing these guys but what I wanted to say about the broader issue and what Nate had also asked me to talk about is how do we win? I think we win by realizing this is not about this election or this primary or this November. This is a longer fight. They're in a longer fight with us. Uh, we have to have a vision of our principles. And so our principles are, are things that we fight for whether we win this time or lose. Our principles are things that when they're violated, we protest. We demand that they be redressed. We punish those who violate those principles. Uh, speaking personally, that means holding those politicians accountable who screw us. You know, uh, and if we don't hold them accountable this time, we hold them accountable next time, uh, because these are about our principles. This is about who we are as a people. Whether we believe we are a democracy, whether we believe that we have a right to have health care, that you don't just get poor and therefore you die because you don't have health care. We believe in public education. We believe in funding public education. We believe that it's a choice to spend all that money on defense versus our schools, versus our cities, versus our roads. Um, these are things we believe. And fundamentally, these are moral issues. This is about who we are as a people, what kind of country we want for our children, for our family, for our friends, and we have to be willing to take the losses that happen due to this dark money and fight back and fight back hard and expose them and keep talk talking and keep pushing no matter what. So I want to end on the words of my mentor who said, if you don't stand up now, when will you? If you don't exert yourselves now, we'll win you. We'll, when will you? How many decades do you intend to wait before you take your stand? I'm not waiting and I know you are neither.